for the purification of the souls and the enlightenment of the hearts and for the hastening of the reappearance of the awaited Savior, Ajallahu Ta'ala, Farajahu Sharif, enlighten your souls and the atmosphere with the recitation of salawat upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Oppression, tyranny, injustice are practices that are considered vile and unacceptable in the minds and in the hearts of human beings. The history of humankind has witnessed much forms of oppression and injustice. Millions of people have been treated in an unfair way, killed, imprisoned, driven out of their lands. Oppression, therefore, is not an alien practice to human beings. In fact, when it came to the first murder that this earth saw, when it came to the sons of Adam, Qabil killing Habil, this in itself was a form of oppression. When we look at the Holy Quran, we find the subject of dhulm or oppression mentioned over 300 times. 300 occasions or more, Allah wa ta'ala speaks about this area, the dangers associated with oppression and indeed how human beings can recognize what truly is oppression and how they should deal with it. Yet the realization emerges and that is that in the minds of people oppression normally is defined as taking the rights of others. When somebody says that I am mazloom, the first thing that comes to their mind is that somebody has taken what belongs to them. Sometimes it's their life. Other times it's their money. In occasions it's their land. Yet the Quran brings forward another notion, another idea that there are two types of oppression. One oppression is the oppression of the human being to themselves. That when it comes to us as human beings, sometimes we practice dhulm upon ourselves. We may be oblivious. We may not be aware of this particular idea. Yet the Quran affirms that in Allah, la yadlimu mithqala dharrah. Allah does not oppress. Walakinna nasa anfusahum yadlimun. That it is people who oppress themselves. The idea emerges in what way? That the term dhulm in Arabic language means that when an individual takes something from its what it should be or what it should be located and placed and places it something else, this is the defi definition of oppression. Allah Taala in the Quran says, the human beings oppress themselves. How do they oppress themselves? The most characteristic manifestation of the oppression of the human being for themselves, ظُلْمُ الْإِنسَانِ لِلَفْسِهِ is what? Is shirk. وَإِذْ قَالَ لُقْمَانُ لِبْنِهِ وَهُوَ يَعِظُهُ يَا بُنَيَّ لَا تُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ إِنَّ الشِّرْكَ لَظُلْمٌ عظيم. That the greatest form of oppression is when the human being transgresses the boundary, displays arrogance, self-centeredness, it presents the ego as the most important in their lives and denies the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or at the same time associates others with the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala a fact that was demonstrated by whom? By Bani Israel. That when Musa alayhi salam saved Bani Israel from Fir'aun and Fir'aun drowned, he took them, thousands of them, they crossed the sea, they came to an area. It, Prophet Musa alayhi salam was to be spoken to by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He left his brother Harun in charge of the community. What happened was that a man by the name of Samari decided to deceive. He built a calf from the jewelry that belonged to the women. And what happened was that he made it have a voice or a sound. People believed that this calf was worthy to be worshipped. And therefore, 
they considered it an object of ibadah, of worship. Musa alayhi salam came back, saw that many of Bani Israel had taken to the worship of the calf. He became enraged. He was disappointed with his community. So much evidence, so much guidance, so much blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yet they would deny it. At the first opportunity, they committed shirk. At the first opportunity, they turned their backs on the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. Musa said to them, Ya qawmi innakum zalamtum anfusakum bittikhadikum ul'ajl. O oh my community, you have done what? You have performed oppression upon yourself. You have committed injustice upon yourself by considering this calf that was built by the Samiri as your God. Therefore, you should do what? Faqtulu anfusakum. Kill yourselves. The Quran says, they, this community was told, you have to kill yourselves as a punishment for what you did, as a punishment for the shirk that you've committed. The narrations tell us that they wore the kafans at night when it was dark, they were all together, they took the swords and they killed each other. This was a punishment that was specific by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala towards whom? Towards this community. Likewise, the queen of Sheba, Bilqis, later on when Sulaiman presents and comes forward and shows her the evidence, she comes forward and says, Rabbi inni zalamtu nafsi. O oh my Lord, I have what? I have oppressed myself. And now I am a believer in what? I am a believer in the Lord of Sulaiman, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran informs us of the dangers and the severe consequences of shirk. Because indeed Allah says, Inna Allah la yaghfiru an yushraka bih, wa yaghfiru ma duna thalika li man yasha. Allah does not forgive those who commit shirk. And indeed He forgives those whom may commit things below shirk. In other words, shirk is the greatest transgression, oppression, act of sin that the human being can perform. The information told to us in the Holy Quran is that sometimes our arrogance creates this type of oppression. How in chapter 18, Surah Al-Kahf, the Almighty Jalla wa Ala informs us of a story of two people who had gardens. They both shared what this ability to own a garden. One's garden was not as good as the other garden. And the other person would boast. He was self-centered. He was full of himself, arrogant, mutakabbir. He would say to the other, Ana akhtharu min kamalan. I am more wealthy than you. And I have more children. I am somebody who deserves to be praised much more than you. The individual informs him, the second one, he says, Do you commit this form of disbelief against the one who created you from soil, from clay? That is why we are told that in Dua Kumail, you and I, what do we recite? We recite in this beautiful, mesmerizing supplication of Amir al Mu'mineen that I myself saw in some Muslim countries that despise the school of Ahl al Bayt and its followers, that publish leaflets, that send terrorists, that bomb the Shia of Amir al Mu'mineen. In those countries, I saw people when they hear Dua al Kumail, they could not help but weep and cry. Tears come down their cheeks. They don't know why, but the words of Ali ibn Abi Talib impacts them so powerfully. Therefore, in Dua al kumay what do we say? We recite and we say, Sayyidi wa Mawlai, zalam tu nafsi. Indeed, that is the admission. This particular individual would not admit that he was arrogant and therefore oppressing his own soul, oppressing his own nafs. وَدَخَلَ جَنَّتَهُ وَهُوَ ظَالِمٌ لِنَفْسِهِ The Quran says he entered the Jannah. Jannah is what? Jannah is a garden. The Quran tells us that they had two gardens. The information told us is that this man enters the garden and was full of oppression. 
against himself he thought that this garden will never be destroyed this particular place will remain and hence the idea that emerges from the Quran is that when he wakes up in the morning he finds that Allah wa ta'ala had obliterated it had destroyed it and he becomes remorseful over the arrogance and the oppression that he had committed at the same time we are told that as human beings we should be careful not to oppress ourselves in other words we have to continuously be in the state of istighfar seeking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lest we are in the position that we think that we are okay that there is nothing that has affected us in an adverse manner and the method of istighfar should be sincere istighfar should be one that an individual speaks between them and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recognizing that it is he who will forgive the sins this method by which an individual speaks solely with the almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala has many fruits has many benefits the quran tells us in chapter 18 whereby the story of some youth are described am hasibta anna ashab al-kahfi wal raqim kanu min ayatina ajaba the quran tells us of the people of the cave the sleepers of the cave as they're known as well as the people of raqim i do not wish to discuss the story of the people of the cave it's an inspirational story and one that the youth are recommended to go and to seek and to take practical lessons and apply it in their lives. There is a story of a people known as Ashab al raqim Who are these Ashab al raqim There were three youth who emerged one day and Raqim is inscription on a rock. So they went and they sought a cave. They saw in this cave a opportunity to explore what was happening. He, they went inside the cave as three youngsters would do. They were gathering around until it so happened that there was a shaking of the mountain and the cave would close. The cave would now be closed. Now they're stuck inside. These three youngsters now were petrified. They said, how will we leave? They came to the understanding that we have to ask the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us. They prayed to him. They said, oh Allah, collectively, they said, oh Allah, help us. There is no one who can take us out of this misery except you. Nothing happened. They stayed there. Now they were anxious. Time was passing. They would not have any food. They would not have any water. They then decided. They said, maybe we need to speak to Allah in isolation. Maybe we need to converse with the Lord. Sometimes you and I, my dear brothers and sisters, we need to communicate and speak to Allah by ourselves. Allah loves the human being, the individual who dedicates a part of their time to have a conversation with the only beloved. Sometimes we're asleep at night and we can't sleep or we wake up and we twist and turn, turn this way and the other way. And we wonder, why is it that I'm unable to sleep? Have you ever, has it ever crossed our minds that it is Allah who's calling us and telling us, rise, perform these ruk'atayn of salah, enter yourself in the state of prostration and feel the sweetness of communicating with me. Connect with me and I will open everything for you. I will facilitate everything for you. Just like how sometimes you and I are looking for a signal on our cell phones. We may struggle in certain areas to find a signal on our cell phones to connect to our people that we like to connect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says come and speak to me and I will give you the strongest of signals I will ensure that you are protected and I will listen to you 
وإذا سألك عبادي عني فإني قريب أجيب دعوة الداعي إذا دعان The Almighty Jalla wa Ala would recall and would ask us, you and I, to allocate certain times to speak to Him. In this busy time that you and I go through, we are engaged, we are so busy. We have our cell phones, we have our smartphones, we have our iPads, our computers, we have the TV, we have the internet, we have people that we communicate with, we speak with everyone, but we do not speak with Allah. And if it comes to the time of Salah, in which Allah has mandated so that we speak to Him, our mind wanders off. It's five minutes. We stand before Allah at the time of Fajr or Dhuhr or Asr. Yet in those few minutes, we are still unable to connect with the absolute perfect being. Therefore, this practice of munajat, this secret whispering was that of the Ahl al-Bayt We have these 15 munajat that have been passed on to you and I by Imam Zain al-Abideen. Salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayh. This munajat, these wonderful supplications of the holy fourth Imam. How wonderful it is that we pick up this magnificent book known as Sahifa al sajjadiyyah We get acquainted with it we start reciting these beautiful words of the imams alayhim salam especially after salah especially at night before we go to sleep begin this connection and this relationship with the almighty jalla wa ala these three individuals these three youth they decided to do this. They said, let's separate. Let's sit in the corners of the cave. Let's supplicate to Allah. One by one, they would speak to their creator. They would empty their hearts to their creator. The first man would say to him, Ya Rabbi Ilahi, when you are very well aware of what I did one day, what did he do that day? He says, Oh Allah, I am an individual who works in a farm and I look after a few people who work for me. And one day somebody who works for me came late. And I said to him, Why are you late? He didn't answer me. I said to him, Should I take away your salary from you today how much i'm going to give you he said it's up to you he worked that day when he finished i gave him an entire salary i didn't deduct anything from him he looked at me and he said i worked very hard today you should give me more i said to him that's all i can give you he left the money and he quit he moved on many years later i took the money and i invested it i bought more cows and indeed this grew my business in the farm many years later he came back this man that quit he said to me do you remember when i quit that day and you didn't give me my salary i said yes he said i want it now i am in need of it i said to him the salary that you didn't take i invested and look at what's happened look at the number of animals and cows and sheep that i have because it is your money that i invested everything that i have is for you and then he speaks to Allah, he says, oh Allah, I did this for you. No one knew of this. This was for your sake, please help me. The narration tell us that when he said this part of the opening of the cave could be seen. The rock that was closing the cave slightly moved by the permission of Allah. The second man would speak, the second youngster would say, Ya Allah, O oh my Lord, you are very well aware that I had a neighbor who was a widow and had orphans. And one day she came to me and said, please help me. My children are starving. I do not have any food to feed them. Please help me. I thought with myself, if she wants something from me, I'm going to ask something back from her. I asked for a vile act back from her. She said, please fear God. Do not ask me to do something which is not permissible. I said, it's up to you whether you take it or leave it. She went back. She came back later and said, it's fine. I will do it with one condition. Let's go to a place where nobody can see us. I said to her, where? She said, think about it. Is there a place that the Almighty cannot see us? That moment when she said this, this shook me. I said to her, I have known the one who has made the mistake. I gave her everything that I own. I gave I gave her the food, I gave her the water, the clothes, and she went away. This young man said, oh Allah, I did this for you. I did this for your sake. Part of the rock moved. The third individual said, Ya Rabbi Ilahi, one day my father was asleep. 
and he had told me, my young son, prepare some milk for me. So I went and milked the cow. I bought the milk and I saw my father asleep. I said with myself, what should I do with the milk? Then I thought, you know what, let's keep it in my hand. Let's keep it warm so that when my father wakes up, I give him warm milk in the winter. I kept waiting for several hours until he woke up. I presented it to him. I presented to him with so much love, with so much respect. And he prayed for me. Oh Allah, you know that I did for this for your sake, so please help me. The narration says, when this man said this, the entire rock was moved and they were able to leave with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, we are told that this sincerity and this devotion to Allah is of the utmost importance when it comes to seeking forgiveness from the oppression of oneself. Yet the second degree of oppression is taking the rights of others away. Tyrants, dictators, oppressors throughout time have masterminded this zulm in all its shapes, in all its forms. Yet the Quran says, be careful. It's not only those that will be blamed on the day of judgment. It's not only those that the finger will be pointed upon. Why? The Quran says, وَلَا تَرْكَنُوا لِلَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا فَتَمَسَّكُمُ النَّارِ Do not be a complicit, do not help, do not stand with those who are oppressors, do not assist them in any shape or form, lest hellfire will also engulf you. So it's not only those individuals who, who oppress others, but if you are happy with their actions, if you somehow pat them on the back, if you support them, if you stand with them, if you assist them in any shape or form, then Allah Taala considers you part of them. There was a man by the name of Ibrahim al-Jammal. He had what? He had camels, many camels. Like today's business, it, it was like a car rental company. Back in the time, they needed the camels to do what? They needed the camels to move. So one day, Harun al-Abbasi, not Rashid, he's not a Rashid. He was not an upright individual. He was a corrupt individual who would say to the clouds, you can rain whatever you wish because the earth belongs to me. This was Harun who killed Imam Musa al-Kadhim. Harun al-Abbasi would come to him and say, I wish to what? Take a few camels as loan because I want to go to Hajj. Ibrahim al-Jammal comes to Imam al-Kadhim. He says to him, Yabna Rasulillah, this Harun wants to take this particular number of jamal camels from me just as a loan can i do that imam says no you are not permitted to do so if you do so then you are a partner in his crime you are assisting him you are helping and aiding him in the committing of the atrocities he is a man that is wretched an individual whom Allah wa ta is displeased with. Therefore, when it comes to our actions, we have to be careful who we align ourselves with, who we support, and therefore the idea exists. And that is, when it comes to oppression, we have to also stand up against it. We have to speak out. We have to make our voices heard. If there is oppression around the world, we have to make the world hear of the need to stand for justice, for human rights, for the rights of civilians and the innocent whose rights have been taken away in any shape or form. Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al-Thaqafi, a wretched individual who would eat his dinner on the skulls of the Alawiyin, of the Shia of Ali Muhammad, an individual who will mix the blood of the Shia with the dough to make the bread, an individual who committed the killing of 100,000 followers or more of Ali ibn Abi Talib. This particular man one day called upon an individual. He said to him, have you memorized the Quran? He said, yes. He said, I want you to recite some Quran for me. This man stands in front of Al-Hajjaj and says to him, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ida jaa nasrullahi wal fatih وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسَ يَخْرُجُونَ مِنْ دِينَ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجًا Hajjaj said, hold on a minute. That's not right. It should be, وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسَ يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينَ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجًا Why are you reciting it as يَخْرُجُونَ Translation, when you see people leaving the religion of God. 
this man said it is because of you that people are leaving the religion of God you are the cause that the people are looking down upon the religion he spoke the word of truth and the Sultan in Jair, he was unfazed the fact that this Hajjaj was wretched. An individual who was what? Who was known for his animosity towards the Ahl al-Bayt. And indeed, when we speak about dhulm and oppression, one cannot think of a group of individuals who were the recipients of so much oppression like the Ahl al-Bayt. From the moment in which Rasulullah passed away from this world until today, this very day, whereby several of the followers of the Ahl al Bayt were torn apart in Iraq today due to their commitment and their love and their displaying of loyalty for Aba Abdullah al Hussein. Suicide so some bombers would kill them because they're going to pay their respects towards the shrine of Hussein, and this is not new. From that moment till today, the oppression against the Ahl al Bayt continues from the taking of the right of Amir al Mu'mineen towards the attack on the house of Sayyida Fatima and causing of her martyrdom towards the usurping of the right of Imam al Hassan and at the same time the wars against Amir al Mu'mineen and the oppression that was faced by Aba Abdullah al Hussein, his family and his companions on the 10th of Muharram and the line and the stories continue one after the other the atrocities need to be written in books and volumes a man by the name as an example Hamid, he comes on the month of Ramadan. Hamid ibn Qahtaba, he comes in the month of Ramadan. He's seen to be eating in Mashhad, in Khurasan, at the time of whom? At the time of Harun al Abbasi. He's seen to be eating. They said to him, Oh, Hamid, this is the month of fasting. Why is it that you're eating? Why is it that you're consuming food? He said, There is no point for me to fast. God will never forgive me. They said, why? What has happened? He said that one day, Harun called me in the middle of the night. When he called me, I thought the worst. I thought that he's about to punish me. I went to the palace, he was drunkard. He said to me, oh Hamid, what is my value in your eyes? How much am I worth in your eyes? I said to him, Ya Amir al fasiqeen we call him, my value, your value in my eyes is what? Is myself. Fida can FC. Harun said, I don't want that. Go back. He said, after an hour, I was called back again. I was asked once again, what is my value? He says, Fida ka nafsi wa ahli. Once again, Harun would dislike this answer. He called him for the third time. Can you tell me how much am I worth in your eyes? The response from Hamid is Fida Kanafsi wa ahli wa mali. Once again, Harun would refuse. He's looking for something more on the fourth occasion. Hamid ibn Qahtaba says to him, Fida Kanafsi wa ahli wa mali wa dini. That's what I'm looking for. Harun says that you will sacrifice your religion for me. Now go with this servant of mine and do whatever he says. He said we went to a particular house. There were what? 20 of the Shia, of the lovers of Ali, innocent souls. They had not committed any crimes except that they follow the path of true Islam, the Quran and the Ahl al-Bayt. That's what they do. That's it. They had not committed anything. Then he says that the servant said, decapitate their heads. They were young in their 20s. So he said, I picked up the sword and I decapitated all their heads. I said, is that it? He says, no, we haven't finished yet. Let's go to another house. He said, we went to another place, a dungeon, whereby there were 20 in their 40s, 20 men also of the Shia, of the, the Alawiyyin. He told me, decapitate their heads, cut their heads off. I did the same until finally we went to the third prison, the third dungeon. There were 20 who? 20 elderly men and I decapitated all their heads except the last one. The last one looked at me and said, Oh Hamid, what will you say to my grandfather Rasulullah on the day of judgment when he will say to you, why did you commit such a crime? On what way can you explain and justify the killing of innocent civilians in such a way? 
He says that I reflected for a moment, but then I thought that I had promised to Harun that I will sell my religion. I picked up the sword and I decapitated his heads. The oppression against the Ahl al-Bayt, indeed one, is found to be prevalent in so many generations. And that's why today when we come to commemorate one of the greatest oppressions that this world has ever seen, we are standing against what happened on the 10th of Muharram. Not only are we seeking to learn from the University of Aba Abdullah al Hussein. not only does the young, the women, the elderly, the youth, all can look at this wonderful school whereby there are so many values and principles to apply. Imam al Hussein stood for so many things that you and I can take away from, can make this Muharram, this day of Ashura, an instigating factor for change in our lives. If I have bigotry, God forbid, if I dislike others just because they're from a different family or a different denomination, then I look at Karbala, the way Imam al Hussein dealt with John Mola Abu Dhar, the servant of Abu Dhar, that he would come he would respect John he would say to him oh John you can go you're free to go but John would say to him I want to fight with you I want to sacrifice my life so that my blood mixes with your blood the way he respected him to denounce any form of racism that Islam comes forward and states that there is no position when it comes to discrimination according to what according to background uh, according to for instance nationalities color creed that is an amazing lesson. If I want to see the value of women in the religion of Islam, then I look at the role played by the women in Karbala and what they did afterwards in ensuring that the message of Aba Abdullah al Hussein reaches the world. They continue to lift the flag of the movement of Aba Abdullah al Hussein. If I want to learn about dignity, if I want to seek lessons about freedom, if I want to know what the value of sacrifice is, then I look at Karbala then that's why I commemorate that's why I weep that's why I cry that's why irrespective of anyone who wants to stop me anyone who wants to kill me anyone who wants to say that this is not something that we should do millions upon millions on an annual basis in every corner of the world stand to indeed commemorate the tragedy of Ashura in order for them to say to the oppressors that we will not succumb to your injustice and oppression that we are the sons of Hussein and in our blood there is that call to rise against oppression and injustice that we will not tolerate any form of dhulam that we will speak out that we will demonstrate that we will write we will do whatever we can when we see that there is oppression going on around the world when we come and to reflect and when we mourn what happened on the 10th of Muharram what is it that comes to our minds what goes through this particular individual when they are commemorating the 10th of Muharram? This is the night to what? To pay our salutations to a lady, Sayyida Zainab, Salamullahi alayha. What did she go through on this hard day? One scholar says that Aba Abdullah al Hussein had to endure what he endured. He saw so many calamities, so many masaib, so many of his family members members his companions slaughtered one after the other but then he was killed he was martyred he attained this lofty position with Allah yet it was Sayyida Zainab that saw this all and had to endure what will happen afterwards the narrations tell us that Sayyida Zainab what did she witness not only did she see Ali and Al-Akbar go and did not return not only did she have to bear the pain and the suffering of, of uh, missing her beloved brother Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas the one who was her protector not only did she have to stand in patience when it comes to Imam al Hussein, who bid her his farewell to her knowing very well what will happen Sayyida Zainab on such a night would see the calamities and the masaib that's why she was called Umm al-Masaib the uh, narrations inform us uh, that after Abba Abdullah al Hussein was martyred, uh, they say.
surrounded his body. Remember that Sayyid Zainab had stood on the Tell Zainab as it's known today that she had that she had told people how can you allow them those individuals to murder the grandson of the Prophet? Is there anyone amongst you who is Muslim? She would witness Shimir sit on the chest of Abba Abdullah. What sight was that? The narrations inform us that when Imam Sajjad was to leave this world, when he was departing from this dunya, Imam Al Baqir was next to him, hugging him, but Imam Al Sajjad would cry and weep. Imam Al Baqir would say to him, Abata, Sayyidi, why is it that you're crying? What is happening? Imam Al Sajjad would say, Now you're hugging me. You are next to me, and I, as I pass away, but I recall who sat on the chest of my body on the plains of Karbala. After they decapitated the head of Abba Abdullah al Hussein, they surrounded him. A man by the name of Bajdal, he sat next to the body whilst others were looting the possessions of Hussein. He saw a ring on the fingers of Abba Abdullah. He said, I will steal this ring, I will take this ring. But every time he wanted to take the ring out, the ring was stuck to the fingers of Hussein due to the blood. So he would want to pull it, but it doesn't come out. He takes a dagger and he severs the fingers of Hussein. He severs the finger so that he can take the ring out. Now Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad cries out, now you have to burn the tents of the oppressors. Indeed, he calls the Ahl al-Bayt oppressors. They now march towards the tents. They started to set them alight. The daughters of Hussein, the sisters of Imam al Hussein. they were running from one tent to another. One particular daughter was running and her dress caught some fire. Humayd ibn Muslim says that I saw a young daughter of Hussein running. I came next to her, tried to distinguish the fire from her clothes. I, she looked at me and says, Ya Shaykh, al anta ma'ana am alayna? Are you with us or against us, O oh man? He says, I am neither with you nor against you. She says, Ya Shaykh, what is the direction of Najaf? Why? I want to complain to my grandfather, Amir al Mu'mineen, as to what people have done to us. Ya Shaykh, al Qur'at al Qur'an. Have you read the Qur'an? Yes, I have, Humayd says. She says to him, Did you read the verse? وَأَمَّا الْيَتِيمَ فَلَا تَقْهَرُ Do not hurt the orphans. Do not injure the orphans. He said, Yes, yes, I've heard it. She says, Ya Shaykh, أَمَا يَتِيمَةُ الْحُسَيْنَ I am the orphan of Hussein. Allahu Akbar. Now, Umair ibn Sa'ad says, Now you have to ten of the horsemen. Ya Khayl Allah Rikabi wa bil jannati abshiri. He says to them, Get ready, do what they say. He says to them, Trample on the body of Hussein. Ajarakum Allah. Assalamu alayka ya sahib al-zaman. Al-Aza, Al-Aza fi hadhi al-layla. They trample on the body. But how do they trample? Imam al-Sajjad was inside the tent. Next to him was Sayyid Zainab. One narration states that Imam al-Sajjad, who was ill, suffering with an illness, cannot stand up. He said to his Auntie Zainab, Auntie Zainab, what is it that I can hear outside? It's as if things are being broken. Things are being smashed. Sayyid Zainab looks outside the tent. She says, my nephew, this is the chest of your father, Hussein, being crushed. The hooves of the horses caused the crushing of the chest 
of Hussein. Allahu Akbar. His mother's ribs were broken. And now Hussein's ribs are broken. They charge towards the tents. Now they want to loot. They want to take whatever they wish. They come inside. Sukaina, they see her, the daughter of Abba Abdullah. They come to her. They snatch her a veil. Then they see that she is wearing earrings. The man who comes wants to snatch the earrings from the ears of Sukaina. He pulls and pulls until he tears the ears of Sukaina. Blood gushes out. He starts to cry. Someone says to him, why is it that you're crying and doing this? He said, because if I don't, someone else will. Allahu Akbar. Now they were running from one place to another. Their veils taken from them whilst they're suffering with thirst. Shimir ibn Dil Joshan enters the tent of Imam Zain al Abidin. Picture the scene. Take your hearts to Karbala on this night of grief and sorrow. Shimir enters the tent of Zain al Abidin. He finds our Imam ill, unable to stand. He says, I said, do not leave a man alive. He picks up the sword, wants to strike Imam Zain al Abidin. But look at Zainab. Look at Aqilat Bani Hashim. Even though she saw all that she saw, she threw herself on the body of a Sajjad. She said, My God, you cannot take him until you kill me. You'll have to kill me first before you kill him. Indeed, Shimmer leaves the Imam. And the family of Hussein are running from one side to the other. The narrations tell us that one day Imam Sadiq in his house, Al Mansur sends individuals who burn his house. Uh, when he sees his house burnt, he sits in the corner and starts to cry. Someone comes to him and says, Ya ibn Rasulullah, Ya Sadiq Ali Muhammad, I know that you've gone through so many calamities, but why is it that you're crying? He said, When I saw my women and my daughters run from one room to another in this house that is burnt. I recalled and recollected what must have happened on the 10th of Muharram. Allahu Akbar. How the family of the Ahl al-Bayt were treated. The children were then gathered. The children were gathered together. They now were presented with some water. One narrations tell us that the one of the young children were presented with some water they all the children would refuse to take water they don't want to take water now after they have gone through what they've gone through this young child takes the water they all look at the young child they say why is it that you've taken the water the child says that my father Hussein was thirsty this is for my father I wish to go and feed my father Hussein, I wish to find where my father Hussein is. What night of difficulty and sorrow is that night? Sayyid Zainab would spend the night in Ibadah, in Salatul Layl. The narrations tell us that when the family gathered around her, she would protect them, she would look after them. When she, they fell asleep, she went out in the darkness of the night looking for the body of her brother Aba Abdullah, the decapitated body of Hussein. She sat next to the body of Aba Abdullah al Hussein. She looked at the body. She placed uh, her hands under the body. She looked up to the heavens. Ilahi taqabbal minna hadha al Qurban. Oh Allah, accept this uh, sacrifice from us. She would be the one who would recall how she would beseech and pray and call upon her grandfather, Ya Jaddah, Ya Rasul. Allah, wa Amma, wa Abata, wa Hamzata, wa Jafara, Hada Husseinun bil Ara, Mukhadabum bid Dima, Maslub al Imamati, wa Rida, wa Bana took a Sabaya. She returns back. The narrations tell us after a while she sees.
means that Sukaina is not there. She's looking for where Sukaina is. She's trying to find where Sukaina is. She finds Sukaina next to the body of her father, Hussein. She could hear the following. She could hear these lines of poetry. She أو سمعتم بغريب أو شهيد فاندبوني فأنا الصبت الذي من غير ذنب ذبحوني Every time you drink water remember the thirst of Aba Abdullah The narrations tell us that Zainab went asleep She went in her sleep in her dreams Once again she was so worried that she was missing the children in her dream she looked at the children and one child was missing she went in the plains of Karbala looking for that child until she saw a lady all covered in black holding the hand of that child she came and said oh lady may Allah give you reward thank you so much for protecting the orphan of Hussein that lady looked at Zainab and says my daughter Zainab do you not recognize your mother Fatima this is Fatima to Zahra Al Aza Al Aza Sayyidati Fatima Al Zahra Ala Lanatullah Ala Al Qawm Al Zalimin وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين وإنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون رحم الله من قرأ الفاتحة